Okay. Morning. 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 Okay. I think we are. It's ten o'clock. We got ten people. Ten and ten. All right. Woo. Yay. Yes. Good yes. group. Yay. Yes. Welcome everybody. Let me do my little thing here. I love this, Carolyn. <laughs> Welcome everybody. So glad to see you all on this bright sunny morning. And, uh, <laughs> so funny. Yes, and we're going to start with a new song. Yeah, we we've done it a while back, but um, thought I'd mix it up a little bit today. This is by uh, John and uh, 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 Jan Garrett and uh, J.D. Martin. Okay. I guess we're going to mute. I'm still on mute, everybody. Mute all. You can leave Jane if she wants to say. Um, I have a mute all button. Can you mute Trump too? No, uh, unfortunately not. He's he's going to have to be responsible for himself, even if he isn't. Jane, is there a problem? Yeah, that's Claudia. That's not the right music. Oh, that's not the right song. <laughs> I mean, we can do either way, either find Claudia's uh, lyrics or, uh, or the down in my soul music. <laughs> uh, Paul, you're muted. You're muted. Paul, you're muted. Okay. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Um, <clears throat> well, that's odd. I wonder why that, okay, well, anyway. Uh, what do you want to do, Jane? Shall we um, uh, all sing it or you want to sing it or? Or we can, or you can just go to Claudia's or, or go to another one that we usually do, whatever is quickest and easiest. Well, if we're going to play the music, the quickest and easiest is just to play this music without, with the wrong words. Okay. All right. So just take, take the words off and we'll just listen to that music. I, I, I can't very well take the words off. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. Everybody close your eyes. Well, I'll tell you what. <laughs> Paul, just mute everybody but me and I'll do it a cappella. People can sing along. It's very simple. Okay. Uh, let's see. I'll have to. I, I have a mute all button and I have a. And I can mute people individually, but that's time consuming. So well, everybody's muted except for you now, Paul. Yeah, so you're on, Jane. All right, we ready? I hear the music down in my soul. Everybody sing along now. I hear the music down in my soul. I hear the music down in my soul. And the whole world world is my home. I got a new day down in my soul. I got a new day 
you down in my soul. I got a new day down in my soul. And the whole wide world is my home. I love the silence down in my soul. I love the silence down in my soul. I love the silence down in my soul. And the whole wide world is my home. Well, I feel the power I down in my soul. I feel the power down in my soul. I feel the power oh, down in my soul. And the whole wide world is my home. Oh, yes, it is. And the whole wide world is my home. Excellent. Thank you so much. <laughs> We're going to do a treatment, and this is Dr. Ken Gordon. So I wanted to give you someone else doing a treatment, and he was the spiritual director, so I thought this was very appropriate. There's only one power in the universe. There's only one existence. There's only one life. There's only one light. There's only one love. Right here and right now, I unify myself with this, recognizing and knowing that its infinite capabilities are in my life and part of who I am. It's knowing this and understanding this that I speak my word. I speak my word for the divine flow of life and everyone who is open and receptive to this idea. I know right here and right now that that power that is sometimes called God is a power that moves and operates through our beings and through our lives, and I surrender myself to it, knowing that it takes me and pulls me to the greatness, the goodness, the love, the joy, the beauty, the light that is the truth of my being, your being, and all beings. I accept that this is the truth for each and every one of us. For I know that that which is divine has created nothing but that which fits in perfection. And each of us awakens to the authentic self that is the truth of who we are and operates from that place without fear or without hesitation. Spirit in turn picks us up, guides, directs us, brings and attracts everything that is necessary to manifest the wonderful, magnificent life that we deserve into our being. In turn, that higher power dissolves and dissipates anything that would block or stop that. From this moment forward, our lives are changed at depth. For we step into this being and this knowing, knowing that we are divine in our nature and divine in our direction. And knowing that the universe is safe and draws and attracts to us all that is required to bring it into being in our experience for ourselves as individuals and for the world as a whole. I accept this as the truth and I give thanks that it is so right here and right now. And joyously, I surrender it back to the universal mind and I allow it to be my truth and live from it with expectation. I let go and so it is. So it is. Okay, we'll do our identity prayer. I know that within myself, there is a life which is perfect, complete, and divine. It was never born, and it cannot die, for it lives and is God. Within myself is wholeness, peace, poise, and the power of life. This life is health, it is abundance, it is love. There is one life, and it is the life of God, and this is my life now, and so it is. We have a pretty different meditation today, but it, it is from Ernest Holmes. 
And it is Bob Baker reading this from Ernest Holmes. Take a breath, get centered, let's begin. Good and more good is mine. An ever increasing good is mine. There is no limit to the good which is mine. Everywhere I go, I see this good. I feel it. I experience it. It presses itself against me, flows through me, expresses itself in me, and multiplies itself around me. Mm. Sit with those thoughts for a moment. Let those words sink in. Expect everything I do to prosper. Enthusiastically expect success. I let good flow into my experience. I am seeing good in every direction I look. I am looking forward to more good. Just bask in the glow of those statements for a moment. I know there is a spiritual center within me which is perfect. Every doubt is being converted into certainty. Fear is being converted into faith. I have an abiding sense of happiness and peace. I am the very essence of peace. I have an inward confidence in my oneness with good. I rest in sublime trust. If you can, visualize that in your mind's eye. Today I expect every good thing to come to me. I know that divine abundance is forever manifesting itself in my affairs. I am keeping my whole mind, thought, and expectation open to new experiences, to happier events, to a more complete self-expression. Everything that belongs to spirit, I accept. Everything that partakes of the nature of divine reality, I claim as my own. Sit with those affirmations and really feel them. identify with success and I prosper in everything I do. As I give thanks for the good now flowing into my life, I gladly share that good with others. The more I give, the more I receive. I experience a deeper consciousness of peace and security. I know that I am in the embrace of a warm, loving presence, forever seeking an outlet through me. Sit with those thoughts for a moment.
am worthy of and entitled to more good. I give myself permission to accept and express more good. And so it is. I love that. I'm thankful. Get so centered, great. And let's begin. Good I'm and one in the spirit all around me. I'm thankful. So grateful. I trust in God. I surrender, I surrender, I know I'm one in the spirit, I surrender, I surrender, I trust in God, I trust in God. Thank you, Jane. Today's message is Dr. Ken Gordon. We, this is like a part two of what he did last week and it's the principles always work. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being in attendance. Thank you for being conscious. Thank you for being awake, aware and alert. Uh, it's important times for us to be able to do that. You remember um, when I spoke last, I don't know, six weeks ago, four weeks ago, three weeks ago, I can't remember what it was, but I, I remember saying that one of the things that I was working on is getting on with my life. I thought, you know, it's time for me to uh, stop waiting for everything in the world to, to uh, come to a conclusion some way so that I can begin living my life again, and instead, how do I get back into it? And so I was asked to write an article for uh, Edward Vilhoon, our spiritual leader, the other day, and I, I started writing, and I started thinking about how do we do that? How do we manage to uh, bring to the prime optimum our health, wealth, creative expression, and loving relationships? And I started thinking about what steps do I take? And you know, I, I've been in this teaching for about, uh, well, over 30 years, and I've been practicing it, and believe me, you know, I'm healthy, I'm prosperous, I'm creative, and I certainly am loved, and I, I in turn, am loving. And, and, and it really occurred to me that there have been some really basic things that I've done with my life. I kind of take my metaphysics um, and, and make it as simple as possible, because I know that once I begin to really get involved and get looking into who I am and what I am and how I work, that I can get bogged down, I can get totally lost in all of the things that need to be done in order to be able to create a healthy life, a wealthy life, a creative life, and a life filled with love. And instead, I, I was thinking, how do we get around to doing this? And, and I, as I began to meditate on it and contemplate on it and ruminate on it, and to be quite blunt, just kind of kicked my can up the street trying to figure out how we do it, it occurred to me that most of my life I have used three basic principles or three basic laws as the standard for what I do. And, and so I thought I would bring today and share those with you because one thing that I've discovered is that they work constantly and consistently. That's what makes them laws and that's what makes them principles is that they always, always, always work. And so as I began to put this article together and this talk together, I, I was thinking about what three they are. And, and I want to start with the first one, which is really the foundation. And my assumption is most everybody knows that this is true already and utilizes it. But by being aware of it, what happens is that we awaken within ourselves the ability to make the transformation. And, and once we begin to step into it and do these things, everything else that needs to show up to make the manifestation and make the change, every other feeling, every other thought, every other source of energy that is required shows up. And so what we do is we begin to work forward with it. And the, the first law is the law of cause and effect. And, and you know that's the basis that I need to go to at any time when I'm feeling like I'm less than or I'm suffering or I'm feeling pinched or scrimped somewhere along the line. 
and the cause, the law of cause and effect is really basic. And, and what that is is that for every effect, there's a cause behind it. And what we know and recognize is that that cause is our thinking. It's our thoughts. It's the way that we present it. It's the way we bring it up. And, and it requires that we make some transformations within our thinking to be able to make the transformation in the outer picture. Now, I, you know, I'll share with you an old, old story that I heard that I've adapted for myself from years ago, and that's the story of the cowboy at the turn of the century when cinema was first coming out, the cowboy who walks into the theater and he's watching the movie, and just when the villain is at most villainous, the cowboy brings out his six-shooter and starts blazing away at the screen trying to kill the villain. Now, you know, that story we've heard before, and it's a good demonstration of, of where our changes and transformations need to come from. And, and, and how I've adapted it is this way, is that I know that that screen is a reflection of something. And, and when I look at it and do the analogy on it, I know that the light of the projector is the consistent, constant part behind it. That light of the projector, I think of spirit. I think about it as uh, God, spirit, goddess, uh, the divine, the thing itself, infinite intelligence, whatever name you choose to put on it. And I know that the reflection that it shows up on the screen is something that I can't change by running up and changing the screen itself. I know that I can take the screen down. I know that I can burn the screen. I can throw the screen away. I can move the projector to point in another direction. But the image still comes through. So spirit is the light. Spirit is that which illumines everything. And it illumines onto the screen, which is our experience. And the thing that makes the picture on the screen is our thoughts and our beliefs. That is the film. So as that film goes through, it will always project outwards. So first thing I know that I need to do is I need to ground myself in the self-responsibility and understanding that I am the director of my life, that I am the Lord of my own being, I am the designer, and that I need to stop being a victim to the outer circumstances, stop being a victim to what's going on in the screen, and actually go within and transform the film itself to be able to make a difference in my life and a difference in the experience that I choose to have in the outer picture. So the first step, the first law, is I get back to the very foundation of life itself and this teaching, which means I ground myself in the recognition and the realization that nobody out there is doing anything to me that doesn't come through me and the way that I view it and the way that I look at it. Now, the minute that I do that, what I do is I put empower myself to be able to make the change on the screen. Now, I'll tell you, is that if I sit back and I look at it and I say that it was all Deb that did it, <laughs> and then I try to go change Deb, I'm no different than the cowboy with the six-shooter trying to lay out the screen. The, the key is, is you've got to go back to where it ca is caused from, and it's caused from your own belief system. So, take responsibility for your life, even if it's uncomfortable. Believe me, the minute that you begin to do that, you empower yourself to make the transformative changes that are required. You, you suddenly allow yourself to realize that that out there, which you think is really affecting you, in reality is something that goes through your perception. The second law that I, that I found that I work on all the time is the law of circulation. Now, the law of circulation is really basic. What it states is everything in the universe flows, and it flows perpetually and eternally. And there's only one thing that can prevent that flow, just like there's only one thing that can make the difference between the light and the screen, which is the thoughts that are there. There's only one thing that can do that, and that's us. And my experience is, is that if I'm having a challenge in my life, I'm either crimping the inlet or I'm crimping the outlet of the energy in my life. And when I do that, what occurs is that things slow down and stagnate. And stagnate's just another word for rot. And they begin to become real stinky and they begin to become really uncomfortable. So I know that if the circumstance that I'm dealing with, which is conflictual, that if I want to change it, what is required of me is to open up the flow of life. 
And that means that I begin to exercise those four quadrants, which Barbara pointed out, which are up on the screen, health, wealth, creative expression, and loving relationships. That, that I begin to look at that and say, how do I need to change this? When it, when it comes to health, I mean, it, it's so obvious. If you don't exercise, if you don't move your body, then what's going to happen is it's going to stagnate. You're going to have a different experience than if you actually do something with it. And it, the same thing goes with the sharing of it and how you put it out into life. The next one, of course, which is wealth or, or prosperity, we, we know that in order to get it flowing, we have to be open and receptive to receive so that we can be open and receptive to give. And often what occurs to us is that we don't and we're not open and receptive to receive. So what we do is we culminate the problem. We create another problem. We exasperate the problem by turning around and realizing we have nothing to give. So therefore, we've crimped it both at the inlet and the outlet. Well, it's the same thing no matter how you look at it. It's the same crimping and it's the same need to have it open for the flow to be able to allow that to move. So if I want to change something in my life, here's what I know. I need that I know that I need to be more receptive to it, and I know that I need to be more expressive of it. In other words, what I need to do is I need to recognize the beauty and the magnificence of life, and I need to be able to share it in my persona and my personality and how I act. That, in turn, kickstarts something and primes the pump to allow that flow to begin to move and to be able to go through it. If I want to increase my creative expression, I know that I have to start going and, and seeing what uh, appeals to me and looking at it and valuing it, giving it some credibility and recognizing it when I see it. And then in turn, putting actually pen to paper or, or a paint to pad, whatever it happens to be, and that's in work as well, as I know that I need to show up at work and give of myself in a more uh, meaningful way than I've done in the past to allow it to express so that I can prime the pump and get it moving, get the thing moving. The same thing occurs with love. I know that if I'm not feeling like I'm being loved or I'm not feeling very loving, that what's required of me is to actually begin to recognize the love that exists all around me at all times and to also start really pushing forward the love that I'm willing to give and express on the outside to make it work. So if I take a look at it, cause and effect, I'm responsible for my own life and the law of circulation, which means that I need to open the valves and the inlets and the outlets to let life flow through me instead of crimping it back. Crimping so I don't give because I'm frightened, crimping so I don't receive because I'm not worthy. However it works, whatever it works to be able to move it. The third one for me is probably the most important, and it came from a woman by the name of Dr. Marcia Sutton years ago, and it was an adage that she, that she said, which I have used as a principle in a law ever since. And what she said to me, she said, resentment blocks prosperity, money follows love. And how I've adapted it is resentment, hatred, whatever it happens to be, blocks energy. Energy follows love. So it opens the door for me to be able to start expressing it in a clear and concise way so that I can actually recognize it. So I, I have in the first place, I take responsibility for my life. The second place is I open the valves so that my life flows, so I allow the, the goodness of life to flow through me. And the third one is I have to be responsible for why I do what I do. Because if I'm doing something out of resentment, then what I'm doing is I'm blocking the flow. But if I do it out of love, then I'm opening the flow. And by opening the flow, what happens is I'm aiding the circulation of life through everything that I do. So let's bring it into a practical experience. So I want to transform my experience and I want to start living my life in all four quadrants, all the different ways that I can. What do I need to do? The first thing I needed to do was I needed to recognize that the change comes from within me. That I can vote, I can do everything that's called upon, I can take action, I can do all the things that are needed that show up in front of me. But the first thing that I need to do is take responsibility for my own thoughts and my own thinking, knowing that it gets projected out onto a screen of my life and gets expressed in that manner and that way. And I'll tell you, the minute that you start doing that, you empower yourself. 
The second thing is to recognize and know that the reason that it's not occurring is somewhere along the line, like a garden hose that I was talking about with the law of circulation. I've crimped it either on the inlet or the outlet, and oftentimes crimped it in both places at once. So the requirement is, is to be able to open it up, to be able to allow it to flow. And the best way that I know to be able to do that is to have absolute joy for the things that I receive in my life. Somebody once told me that the opposite of resentment is gratitude. And to be able to utilize that gratitude, what is necessary is to see it when it comes. I've told the story many times about when uh, Deb and I were really needing money uh, when we were farming. And I kept waiting for checks to show up in the mailbox. And lo and behold, every day I'd go out and there'd be a stack of bills that were this high. And I'd look at the bills and I'd go in the house moaning and groaning about it. And no checks came. And, and finally, one day I went out and I was looking through the mail and I saw a letter and it had an unstamped 35 cent stamp on it. And I looked at it and the first thing I thought was, oh good, 35 cents, how wonderful. And then as I was crossing the road from our mailbox back to the farm and I'm looking at it, I suddenly realized what I was doing was I was condemning my own prosperity with my attitude. So I remember when I walked inside the house, Deb said, did we get a check? Did we get a check? And I said, no, but we got 35 cents in an unstamped stamp. And, and I began to empower that. And, and I began to realize all the beauty and the magnificence that exists all around it. Yesterday, I went and picked apples at Blair's Orchard. I picked nine big bags of apples on a beautiful fall day. How can you get better than that? To sit there and have these beautiful, crisp things that are gifted to you and to be able to utilize on a beautiful day with the beauty all around me, my life is a good life. Your life is a good life. And find the things that you can choose to really embrace and be grateful for and open up the inlet into that hose of the law of circulation. Open it up by empowering that side of it. But that's not enough. Then you have to turn around and you have to give it and express it back out the other way. So this morning when I came into the center, I brought two big bags of apples for the people that are here. I, 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 yesterday, I had the greatest sense and feeling. I, my neighbors uh, had to cull all of his Macintosh apples off his trees because he had coddling moth in the spring. And so he's used to having two trees of apples, and he didn't have any. And so what I did when I got these apples was I heard him out mowing the lawn in the back, and so I went and leaned over the fence and said, hey, hey, I, I just went and picked apples. Would you like some? And he said, oh, yeah, we were just talking about that. We'd love some. So he came over and got the apples and took them back. And when he was bringing the bag back to me again, he brought over a big box of uh, homemade brownies, chocolate brownies, without any flour, by the way, although I think it was coconut flour. But, but, but he brought that over. The only reason I'm sharing that with you is because of the feeling that I had giving him the apples. And for that matter, the feeling I had receiving the chocolate. It's kind of like a funny thing, but that's what I meant when I said, when we start a journey of doing something, everything shows up for us. Everything appears before us that we need to learn and we need to know. Because I'll tell you, as where I felt great giving him the apples, I really did, I felt wonderful, because I had a whole pile of apples. But when I felt great giving him the apples, that's one thing. I didn't feel so good when I felt that he had to barter with me to bring chocolate to let me have. And, and, and I know he was doing it from his own sense of feeling and good, which is good. But that awareness of knowing that, when I take a look at my life and take a look at the film that I have that's running through, I realize that maybe perhaps I need a little bit more openness in the receiving. I'm okay on the giving this time. And next time it might be the other way around, but I need a little bit more on the receiving. And this is the law in action. Resentment blocks energy. Energy follows love. Practice it. Practice it in the four quadrants. If you want more health and vitality in your life, then maybe what you could do is, you know that, that thing you know you had to do, walk up the stairs or go for a run or go for a bike ride, but you didn't do it because it hurts when you get home from doing it? 
I'll tell you, that's the law in action. It only hurts because there's something there for you to know to be able to move forward with it. It's the same thing with creative expression. You know, uh, you, you want to be more creative in what you do, then you have to acknowledge and give power to the creativity you see. You listen to Barb and Neil do their music here and, and you see that creative flow that's there. We have to celebrate that. We have to celebrate it everywhere we see it in our lives so that what we can do is we can have it within us so that we can express it out and give it away again. When you, when you talk about uh, um, love and loving relationships, try this one on. If it's crimped for you and you've got some resentment blocking your flow, try this. Try loving somebody who you don't love. Try going through and then see what it feels like to do that, to do something loving or nice for somebody that maybe perhaps you didn't really want to. And then you get to have that feeling and you can see that feeling is the direct reflection of what's on your film that spirit goes through that puts it out onto the screen. And if you want to edit your film, then you begin to edit your feelings. And you begin to look at it and say, is this really real? Is this really true? And then what happens is you turn around and you go and you start loving outside yourself. You start giving your love away to that which you appreciate, that which you value, that which makes your life stronger. Prosperously, pros, uh, pros, <laughs> financially, it's the same thing. Perhaps financially, it's even more important than anything else because that's when the feelings, at least for me, really come in. Try this. In a couple of minutes, we're going to have an offertory here. Why don't you give more than you're comfortable with? Why don't you write that check to where you get your good? And it doesn't have to be the center. I mean, it would be nice, but it does because we're buying some new technological equipment and it would be nice to have some income. But, but try it with where you want to give your good. And instead of giving that five, give that 500. And see what happens. See what feelings you have. Because I'll tell you, those feelings are directly attached to the film you have that goes out to the screen of your experience in your life. That's the feeling. And you've got to know what it is. Marcia Sutton also says that awareness is curative. So when you make that connection, when you connect to that, what you're really doing is you're looking at what you feel about giving. Or you're looking at what you feel about receiving whether it be health, wealth, creative expression, or loving relationships, become aware of who you are. Take the responsibility. So, the three in a nutshell are this. The law of cause and effect. Be responsible for everything in your life. Know that the film that God is shining through to put on the screen of your experience is reflective of what you believe and who you are. The law of circulation. If there's any block whatsoever, know that it either is with inlet or outlet. And open yourself up by receiving in a healthier fashion and giving in a healthier fashion. And finally, know what you're feeling when you do this. Resentment blocks energy. Do not do things out of resentment or hatred, even for a good reason. Instead, look at what you're feeling when you do it. When you write that check, look at what you're feeling. And as you do it, and as you give it away, recognize that that is the editing tool that you have that can transform your life. It's worked for me for over 30 years. It'll work for you because it's a law. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. I will see you at Thanksgiving. Know you're loved. God bless you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Okay. That was kind of powerful. Bringing us back to lore and the three, three laws that he uses. I thought that was important. Yes. So we're going to do a song now. more than enough in a universe that you created. There is
is more than enough on a planet of sacred design. There is more than enough for humanity made in your image. Why would I worry? Why would I doubt? Why would I ever think I'd go without? Why would I worry? Why would I doubt? Why would I ever think I'd go without? Your infinite love made me, made everything I see, and all that we There is more than enough for humanity and in your bed. Why would I worry? Why would I doubt? Why would I ever think I'd go without? Why would I worry? Why would I doubt? Why would I? song i never heard that beautiful good job jane jane spends hours picking out songs that work for us so yeah thank you jane we used to sing that one at unity did you yeah that's a cool song i like that i like the the um why would i worry why would i doubt <laughs> Why would I ever think I'd go without? Right. Yeah. Uncrimp. <laughs> you're uncrimped. Oh, yes, you're uncrimped. Uncrimp that hose. <laughs> That's right. You're muted. Oh, you're going to stay muted in. Yeah. Okay. Those of you who are still muted, please unmute yourself if you wish to speak. Um, he used a creative malapropism which malapropisms just tickle me pink um he said exasperate the problem instead of exacerbate the problem oh <laughs> i didn't even pick that up it's i always say it that way yeah and and says it that way a lot and's very good at at creative malapropisms <laughs> it's, and she doesn't realize she's doing it so she's trying to talk to me and i'm rolling on the floor dying laughing and she's wondering okay what did i say <laughs> what did i say <laughs> well she likes to keep you guessing <laughs> so how did you like him i thought it was a really good 
Yeah, yeah it was. That's, terrific. Yeah, that's powerful. You know, he's a we, good teacher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he is. And I mean, you know, part of what he's uh, <clears throat> saying, you, I mean, y'all are going to roll my eyes again, but I mean, roll your eyes again, but it's something I say that you have to realize that everything is a blessing. Yeah. I mean, you, if, when you realize that everything is a blessing, then you begin to do as he says is to start moving into gratitude and, um, you don't have as much of a tendency to, uh, go into resentment when you're, you know, when things don't turn out the way you expected or wanted. Uh, but anytime things turn out in a way that you didn't expect or want, or anytime things are going in a way that you don't want, if you can retreat back into that, well, I don't know what the blessing is that's coming out of that, but I know the blessing is there and I'm going to be grateful for it, even though I don't know what it is. Yeah. Yep. Always. Well. I um I like that and I've heard this used before and and so I think of it this way frequently uh, um well occasionally anyway uh, the thing about the screen about the movie yeah. and um the the screen is the you know is the effect is the outer appearance in the world and but if you want to change it you don't go up to the screen you don't shoot the screen <laughs> you have to go to the projection booth and uh, change the film <laughs> or the original thoughts, right? So, right. yeah, the Course in Miracles says that all things properly perceived are for man's benefit. That's the same as Paul saying everything's a blessing. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a different way of saying the same thing. Yeah. Um, well, I think everything I can... properly perceived is a, is, is a blessing. Yeah, what well, the course say? says, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but the course says everything properly perceived, which is, I think, the key, right? Properly perceived is for man's benefit, for man's evolve. Yeah. Okay, right. So everything's in divine order, you know. Well, that's taking responsibility for your own actions. Yeah, well, yeah, they're all tied together. Yeah, it's taking responsibility for your own thoughts. You could look at it. Uh, a different way that that um, say that phrase again, Tom. Uh, all things properly perceived are for man's benefit. So it's not that if you improperly perceive it, it's going to not be for man's benefit. It's that all things are for man's benefit. Right. And if you are properly perceiving them, then you will see that. You'll realize that. Yeah. Yes. The, the all things are for man's benefit. They're all a blessing. And the proper per perception is that they are a blessing. Yeah. Having an improper perception does not change the blessing. It only changes your perception of the blessing. Yeah. Oh, that's I a good see. distinction, Paul. That's a good distinction. Well, let's... Um, I, I thought part of what was powerful about the message was this concept of recognizing how what's going on in your mind and what you're doing and what you're, you know, you're thinking, feeling, uh, saying and doing is affecting that what's going on in the projector. So it's, it's all fine and well to say that it's not the screen, it's the projector. Okay, great. What does that mean? But, you know, part of what he was talking about was how to understand how I have control over the projector, what's going on with the projector. That was the, for me, that was the important part of what he was saying, or part, right. an important part of what he was saying. What I, what I thought was powerful was he quoted somebody as saying, awareness is curative. It's what? Awareness, awareness. is curative. Yes. And I think just, and I think that's true. I think just the awareness of something puts in, puts in motion 
regardless of what we think or perceive, just just having that awareness puts puts in motion the things that are needed to deal with it. Yeah, yeah. I agree. This is um, this this is something that goes along with what I teach about forgiveness. Um, you know, I teach that uh, forgiveness is for the forgiver, apology is for the apologetic, uh, and <laughs> The, the role of apology is not for the benefit of the person that's being apologized to. The, the benefit of apology is the awareness of one's own uh, responsibility in whatever the event was that caused the need for forgiveness. So, uh, the apology is essentially taking responsibility for, you know, taking ownership of uh, your own actions. And that is essentially, you know, uh, becoming aware of what, uh, of, of your own part in whatever the event was. And only when you do that can you then change your behavior only when you become aware of your own um, actions and how they affect others only then can you begin to make a change on it there's a a it's not exactly a poem uh and i've i have it on my website but i've forgotten who the author was but it's uh basically says i walk down the street i fall in a hole it's a deep hole. It's somebody else's fault. You know, I have a tough time getting out. Uh, you know, I don't know why this is happening to me. And then the second thing is I walk down the street. There's a big hole. I see that it's there. I fall in anyway. It's still somebody else's problem. I have a tough time getting out. The third time it's I walk down the street. I see the hole. I fall in the hole anyway. I realize that it's my fault. I have an easier time getting out of it. Uh, the third, the next time I walk down the street, I see the hole, I walk around it. And then the fourth or the next one is I walk, uh, I choose a different street to walk down. So there's this kind of uh, progressive realization of one's own uh, responsibility for what's going on yeah and sometimes it takes us a long time to get it <laughs> yeah. maybe maybe more than three or four times yeah no. is it okay to be in the thousands <laughs> yeah i, I think i yeah, think Bob. <laughs> the universe keeps giving you the choice yeah well and Ann and i've come to understand that you are exactly where you need to be. And if you are continuing to make the same mistake, you could call it the same mistake. Uh, you could also call it that you haven't quite gotten as much of that blessing as you would like yet. Uh, but the point is that if you are having the same thing present itself to you, then that means that you have that you're not ready to progress beyond that. And or maybe you are. Maybe well, I mean, if you are ready to progress beyond it, you'll progress beyond it. Right. If you haven't progressed beyond it, it's because you haven't been ready to yet. Yeah. Yeah. Putting it in the past makes all the difference. So I want to share something I got from Ernest yesterday, which is very simple. I often open the the book just to see where it opens to. And it was involution. Involution leads to evolution. Another way of saying what we've, we've been saying here, involution, what I put in comes out. And then I had a healing this morning. Um, and it came to me in this, that I became aware, thanks to everybody that contributed to the potential for looking back to good the habit of looking back in resentment. I think it was the speaker's focus on resentment 
that was so clarifying for me. But immediately I felt this understanding that I, I can be a very tough guy if I decide to. And I have kind of let myself fall into this easy way of blaming, 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 being resentful of that, um, rather than looking back for there's good that can come from this. And so looking back in good is a healing for me this morning. So nice. finding the challenge and in the moment to, okay, how do I make it good that that happened? A cup on the counter. Cup on the counter. You know, how you make it good is you realize the good in it. Right. It is good you know, already. Make it real. It, it is good already. You make it real for yourself. Also, yeah, this is, thank you. go ahead, Karen. Now, I was just going to say all these laws keep you healthy if you look at them. When you have a blockage, it's inside of you. That's usually what happens when you get cancer. <clears throat> When anything happens, there's a blockage somewhere in your body. Yep. And if you can do away with all the resentment and uh, not to live in resentment, think how healthy you would be in your body. Yep. You, would feel, you would feel more alive. You would feel, you know, wanting to do things, wanting to get out there and do things. But when you have resentment, it blocks so, so much. Yeah, you That's know, fun. yeah, he talked about uh, that, um, uh, about gratitude as opposed to resentment. He also talked about love as opposed to resentment. But uh, <clears throat> I was thinking about how do we clarify number three? First, he was talking about opening the valve to, to flow, and you do that by experiencing gratitude or love and but he's he he said that energy follows love and i have a little bit of a bone to pick with that i think it's probably the most powerful um flow energy flow is is being directed by love but i i really think what he's talking about with the with number three um he didn't really he didn't really specify what that law was but um but in my teaching i talked that it, i've learned that it, um energy flows where attention goes you know yeah. that's an easy way to remember it so if your attention goes towards resentment that's that's what's going to show up in your life and it will crimp it will crimp the um Oh, then we'll crimp the hose eventually, <laughs> but <laughs> that's but that's, that's what's going to that's what's going to result, you know, going back to the cause and effect, yeah. and so um, so I think energy also follows. I don't know, I don't know. It does end up <laughs> crimping the hose, doesn't it? <laughs> no, it just seems like it does. But that's but a good way like to you... think about it, though. That ener energy flows where attention goes. So whatever you put your mind on. Yeah that's that's the kind of thing that's going to manifest in your life and it may manifest in in the in your world getting smaller and smaller and meaner and meaner but <laughs> so whatever Jane, you put energy into gets bigger yeah so energy is always flowing it's yes. always going and yeah like you said and so it's not just love that produces energy fear produces a lot of energy but you're going to get things back at you that yeah make you more fearful yeah mm. Yeah. You yeah. said, I don't know, Jane. What happens when I don't know? What does energy follow? <laughs> Confusion. <laughs> well, Alzheimer's. <laughs> it's a, uh, you know. Um, I liked what he was saying about open and receiving. Like, yes. Um, like open and if you're not open you're frightened he said and if you have a, a problem with receiving it it's that you're not feeling worthy and and that really um that touches it for me and i've worked on that for a while um receiving you know and that's important too you have to be open to receive in order not to, to crimp it you know 
That's why I didn't understand his uh, feeling kind of bad about taking the brownies. It's like, wait a minute. Well, I think he he was the the, the what challenge. He to work on. Yeah, that's what. Yeah, he yeah right. the the challenge is that. Um, what he doesn't want it to fall into is transactionalism. Yeah. Transactionalism is a worldly thing. You know, this for that quid pro quo. Yeah. That's a worldly thing. And, uh, you know, the situation that he was in was that he was giving apples to his neighbor and the neighbor was in gratitude, giving right. him something not really in return. You know, his, his way of thinking about it is it appears that this is in return for me giving him the apples when really he was giving the apples out of love and um, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and the neighbor was giving him brownies, not in return for the apples, but as a, um, oh, well, so. you know, just well, as an expression of gratitude for having the neighbor that, you know, loves him enough to give him apples. I experienced that once when right. I was single and I was living in San Antonio in my house. And one night, a neighbor, the couple, the older couple lived across the street and the man came over with a pizza. And he said, we ordered pizza tonight from Caesar Caesar and we didn't know where to get two pizzas. Would you like a pizza? <laughs> well, sure, yeah. And I thought, oh, would you like some peach? He goes, my two peach trees were just producing. So we both gave out of the abundance that we had, you know, shared from our abundance. You know, I gave him a big bag of peaches and he gave me a pizza. So <laughs> But it wasn't but it, it wasn't transactional. Yeah. It you know, yes, right. they both were giving each other was, something at the same time, calling. but it was not a this for that. Right. It was not a quid pro well, it was not a quid why pro did, quo. <laughs> yeah, and, so he you know he has said that whenever you start on, you know, the the journey that everything shows up which then which is in the way all the things that are not that show up for us and that's what showed up for him that he had some work to do on the giving and receiving on the receiving end why do you all think that it that seems to be universe almost universally so with us at least in the spiritual community that it's easier to give actually than it is to receive so why do you, why do you think no. that is no. no i receive easily you can give me anything you want no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hmm. We're taught it. I, 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 called, I saw my mom doing that. You know, she was like such a giving person, but she didn't want to receive. No, no. And I thought, <clears throat> well, that's stupid. You know, you're giving out, and how's this other person going to be able to give out? You know, if you don't receive. Yeah. So there, there is the saying that it's better to give to, than to receive. But if all you're willing to do is give and not receive, then you're denying the other person the better part. Right. You know, you're it's uh, right. receive, uh, giving and not receiving is a form of selfishness. <laughs> yeah, for me, it goes back to the nuns. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and then you you don't get replenished, so eventually you can't really give either. That's right. Yeah. I think the the this idea of that you can give but you can't receive is is kind of tied to the um, uh, American rugged individualism, you know, to receiving things is admitting that, um, uh, uh, that I might need something and I can't need that, something yeah. if I'm going to be a rugged individualist. I have to be able to do it all myself. And, you know, that's now that's, a, that's an interesting thought, Paul. What 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 does anybody else think about the giving and but it's harder to receive? Oh yeah, I, I never thought you of know, it. And I uh, both said that we're taught it. Yeah. Well, I think Paul has a good. I think point. it has to do with worthiness. Yeah, worthiness. My yeah, uh, that's what I was going to say. I think it has to do with uh, self-esteem. Mm -hmm. That's fine part of it I, but I, I think what paul said is is a good point too mm -hmm. is that you violet yeah hi hi <laughs> yeah hello hello yeah i think what paul said from a male perspective 
it's kind of like Rug yeah. when you're going somewhere and you don't the male doesn't want to look at the map. Which which is kind of funny because some it male or female, it doesn't matter which. Some people are good at at uh, uh, I don't know if I should call it directions, but are just being cognizant of where they are and where they're going. Some people are good at that and some people are not so good at that. So we can help each other. Yeah, but we can help each other. Right. So Kathy, I appreciate your nun uh, comment. And of course I spelled it N-O-N-E. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. Uh, yeah, and I went, I went back to being slapped in the face in eighth grade in front of the whole class. Yeah. You know, and in my language, that's a trauma that is still resident in my system and deserves the kind of going back to find what could be good about that. You know, yeah. I don't think I, I will ever slap anybody. They you know, laugh. That, that is a, uh, I won't claim that that is the blessing, but I will claim that that is part of the blessing. Yeah. And what did you say, Kathy? They locked me in a box and hung me in the closet by my collar. Oh my God. <laughs> I was such that's, a good child. <laughs> I'm so sorry. That's, you know, and nowadays that's considered child abuse. Oh, oh definitely. I mean, they, they could actually go to jail for stuff like that. Kelly, are you serious? Oh yeah. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Well, I went to public school and my brother heard me screaming and he came out of his classroom to find me. And I was in a box in the principal's office, <laughs> locked in a box. In, in a cardboard box? Yeah. No, no. It was a, it was like a wooden box that had a, a lock and everything. Yeah. It was the Iron Maiden. <laughs> And then they, wow. hung me in the closet. they hung me up when I was little. I couldn't touch the floor by a hook. <laughs> you, you and Bob need to get together and talk about <laughs> yeah. your not, not really. <laughs> Wear your ninja outfit. We'll go tonight. <laughs> it's we'll Halloween coming it. up, you know. Yeah. That's right. Good one, Carol. I, I don't think they're doing that anymore because they would seri yeah. Yeah. seriously, they okay. would go to jail. Oh yeah, that, oh, school. Yeah. I remember. I think it was third grade. The teacher tied a girl to her seat and put tape over her mouth. Oh and, yeah. And that happens nowadays. It gets all over the news, and the teacher gets fired and take you know put in front of the uh, child protective services, and you know all kinds of nasty stuff happens. Well, yeah, that, there's there's lots of stuff that happened to us that nowadays would result in legal actions. Yeah, well, thank God, but it has a lot to do with not being worthy, you know? Yeah, you well, and the, and the blessing life. or part of the blessing that comes out of that, and this is what I say, you know, um, you think of the Holocaust as being a horrible thing that happened, and yet the blessing that came out of that is that uh, mankind kind of has in its DNA now that we're not going to accept that kind of behavior out of us as a society. Right. I mean, some people are still not quite there yet, but uh, for the most part, uh, for the most part, mankind abhors that kind of thing. And before World War II, we didn't abhor that kind of thing. So that you we know, didn't I mean, even think it could happen. That's why. Yeah, we didn't. We didn't. Uh, we had no concept of it happening. Yeah. Okay. Now well, we have a concept, and we've rejected that concept. Well, well just like uh, uh, George Floyd. I mean, we had no concept of the systematic racism in the police department until he died. Yeah. You know, and so that okay. helped us too to awaken to what goes yeah. on that we didn't know a thing about. Yeah, I think we kind of knew that stuff like that was going on, but it was it was a little too easy to sweep under the rug, and now it's you can't sweep it under the rug anymore. Kathy, what has it become for you? Well, I uh, 
didn't understand that one nun had almost 70 something kids in her class by oh. herself. You know, I see my old pictures in grammar school and I started counting and I just couldn't <laughs> believe how many kids were in my class. It was just crazy. one teacher. One teacher, one nun. Mm. Wonder. It was <laughs> nice, that's why. <laughs> yeah, so it was, you know, and all our homework was done in one night and all corrected and everything. So it was a hard job for them too. I'm not saying that was a great way to do it, but uh, you know, I wasn't the greatest kid. <laughs> I kind of was, um, you know, whatever. I can see why. <laughs> you wanted to get attention. You 70 kids, they didn't even know who you were until you did, acted up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess. I don't know. I, I just want to know why. I didn't accept things that they said because they said it, you know. So and troublemaker. Uh, <laughs> I know. Kind of. <laughs> Yeah. It, what, it, what did your parents say to that? What what happened when you know you went home? My father, my father went to the convent because one night I came home and they hit my hands. We had to go like this, and they did a a ruler. Mm -hmm. and I did that in my school too. Yeah, and it went down to the bones of my knuckles. I mean, <laughs> it was. I mean, and my father almost hit this nun. They had to call the police and everything because he. Yes. <laughs> Oh, Dad. I want to see this nun and I want to see her now. <laughs> and they had a, they called the police and had to get them off. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Then they knew where you got it from. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Was, uh, and he was a quiet here, guy. He was not. Here, yeah. Here's the interesting thing. In that time, they called the police to get him off of her. Right. Nowadays, they would call the police and haul the nun off. Yeah, yeah. And and she would go to jail and face charges. Yeah, but they, you know, they didn't have the easiest life either. The nuns. No. No, it's, I mean, the the thing is that the 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 easy, the not having the easiest life doesn't necessarily excuse the behavior. Right. But, but I, the emphasis for me is. The emphasis for me is the change between then and now. now. I could say in some cases we've gone a little too far the other way, but um, uh, you know we've we've gone too far the other way in that we. Uh, well, let me use my sister for an example. Uh, I don't know where she got this idea, but she got the idea that that discipline was a bad thing. Now, I think that kind of rooted in the physical discipline yeah. is a bad thing. Yeah. You know, I, I definitely agree that that physical um, physical violence discipline is not a good thing. All you do is teach the child violence. You know, violence is a means of solving their problem. <laughs> uh, but uh, her her solution to that was no discipline whatsoever. Yeah. And the, what I observed in my niece was that, um, you know, some days mommy felt good and, and she could, I mean, she could push mommy a long way before she blew up. And some days mommy was not feeling so good and it didn't take much of anything and mommy would blow up. So for this particular child, it got to where she could not play normally because she was so, uh, it, it was kind of an obsessive compulsive thing. Uh, she was um, obsessed with seeing how far can I push mommy this time before she blows up? Because it was, you know, some days she could push, push, push and mommy was, you know, feeling good and you know, wouldn't blow up. And yeah, so some, some days it was, you know, some days it was a hair trigger. So she never knew where it was. She, you know, her boundaries yeah. uh, were poorly defined. Constantly moving. And constantly moving and poorly defined. Some days they're, you know, very resilient boundaries. Some day they're hard, and, you know, hard boundaries. And um, 
you know, this idea that you're not going to do discipline. Well, if you, if through that you end up creating a situation where you blow up and then you spank the child, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of counterproductive. So, um, but the child couldn't play normally because the child couldn't play normally because she was so focused on finding out where is the boundary now because the boundary was never in the same place. Yeah. And there you know are, there is a school of thought of not disciplining, but, um, <clears throat> but it has to be accompanied by constant um, reinforcement of positive behavior. Well, um, yeah, so, it has to be. Which requires a, a lot of energy. <laughs> well, what, what my takeaway from that was that a, a child that has poorly defined boundaries is going to be very insecure. And a, a child that has um, not necessarily hard boundaries, but consistent boundaries, the boundary is in the same place all the time. It has a little bit of resilience to it, but it's in the same place all the time then the child can go, I mean, it's in the, it's in a child's nature to, to figure out where their boundaries are. And so the child will go test the boundaries a little bit. And, okay. There it is. You know, it's yep. It's still there. And, and I can feel secure about that. Now, this is a whole different, this is a different discussion from how is the discipline uh, enforced. And I definitely agree that any kind of physical violence is, is not productive uh, you know there may be times when you have to restrain the child not block them in a box but you know <laughs> well uh, it, it gets back to to knowing uh where it came from you know yeah. it, it took me a while to realize where the unworthiness came from and once yeah. you realize where it came from then you can handle it you know but the blessing was it did make me stronger and it made me stand up for myself and uh yeah. And you know, yeah, you know, I had to go through uh two past life regressions to find out where my unworthiness came from. Wow, cool. Well, I found it and I found the link. Okay, that life led to this next life where mm -hmm. I tested some other things and that led to this life. And so, oh, okay, it makes more sense. Yeah. And and if you don't put the time into yourself it it just it just goes out and affects everything in your life you mm -hmm. know every relationship you have everything it it's it's really it's really different it's it's um you know i was married twice and it's like the common denominator is me so <laughs> i'm not doing this again until i figure this out you know so uh yeah yeah. That's one of the things that I teach. The the big irony in life is that you cannot have a healthy relationship until you don't need it. Aha. Uh -huh. That's interesting. Okay. You don't need another person to give you anything. Right. And, right. You, know, you you can't yeah. have a you cannot have a healthy relationship until you don't need the relationship. Right. When you come into a relationship from a point of neediness, right? That that uh, prevents it from being a healthy relationship. And you don't need someone yeah. Else to make you. Yeah, I think that's I think that's good. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's a hard lesson that I had to learn. Yeah, it is. Yeah, but it, I think it we is. all have to we all have to learn our lessons. <clears throat> And that's why science of mind was so wonderful for me because it was everything. I mean, it made so much sense. It was the only religion I've ever tried that made any sense. That's so. because it's not, it's not a religion. It's a, it's a spiritual discipline. It's not a religion. And, and you know, people. Is there I gunfire? I don't want to work at it, but it's it's a, a, it's a constant. It's a constant um, in your head. You have to. It's something you live. It's it's who you are now. You know. 
Yeah. Well, Bob, what did your parents say when you came home after you told them you were slapped in the face? You deserved uh, it or what? What? No, I didn't. Of course, I didn't tell. You didn't tell them. Okay. No. First, dad wasn't there. And second, mom was probably uh, absorbed elsewhere, drinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you didn't have anybody to let anybody know how you felt. Bootsy, the neighborhood dog. Okay. <laughs> she and I were great friends. Okay. Okay. You have a dog now? Yep. <laughs> okay. Yep. Yeah. Okay, how are we doing? Anybody else? Betty, did you want to say anything? I know we had you muted for a while. You know, talking about physical, I, I remember I had a teacher once that, I, I don't know, I guess she caught one, one of the kids lying and she hung a we they you they didn't much use any kind of physical stuff. I went to a public school, <laughs> but she hung a, a sign around her neck, liar. You know, and I went home and told my mother about that and cried. And I said she is a terrible teacher. Yeah. And uh, I said I I wanted to you know I told other people about it, and it wasn't a physical thing, but it was an emotional hurtful thing that she did to that child. Yeah. Was that more painful than what happened? Yeah, <laughs> what they did to you, hanging you up by the collar, that was terrible, awful too. <laughs> I mean, but that always stuck in my mind. I don't remember her name, Miss Spellman. Oh, wow. She never did anything terrible to me except yell at me. But, yeah, yeah. I, I remember all their names. <laughs> It, 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 sound, it sounds like a challenge for forgiveness. Yeah, yes. it, is. it is. I started thinking, you know, from their point of view, she didn't have a lot, a lot of kids. But she did that, you know? And everybody backed you up, the principal and everybody, you know? And you never said anything against the nuns, but... Um, it's a different way of looking at it. I, I was a challenge. <laughs> I was a challenge and I was, I was, um, my brother was a year ahead of me and he was very good, really good. So they were shocked when they got me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he softened them up for you. A sweet oh, yeah. little girl, yeah. <laughs> that, that's always a problem when you're in school is having a sibling. I had a twin sister who was yeah. in the same grade. Yeah. I always got, why can't you be more like your sister? Oh, God. Oh, Every dude. day. Yeah. Which didn't help me be more like my sister. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And you said, um, uh, you didn't want to be like he, your sister. He doesn't have the same, he has different equipment than I have. <laughs> I can't be the same as her. Yeah. Yeah. That's. You learn, you know, you learn and, they, and and thank God the world isn't like it was, you know? Yeah. And that's, I didn't you know, know that kind of about what, you, Tom. Yeah. What, that I had a twin sister? Right. right. Yeah. Does she have a beard? No, her <laughs> beard is not quite as, as long as mine. But. <laughs> so... Anyway, Does we, she live around here or has she moved away? She lives down the street from Sojourners. Oh, okay. Where is Sojourners? Oh, oh uh, Elliot's. It's my neighborhood. She lives near me. Oh, she's not far. I've never met her. Betty Ann, she's only about five minutes from you or a little more. I know, because I used to go to Sojourners. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Betty, you're on Fairway. She can't, fair, uh, Sojourners is across town. Yeah, Sojourners is. Not that far. Well, I mean, it's uh, I, yes. going toward Monticello. Yeah, it's at Elliot and Monticello. Not that, far. That, that, those roads. Yeah, my sister lives on Elliot. Yeah, actually, when I was younger, <laughs> I could walk from here to Sergeant. It was a bit of a walk, but I could have done it. 
<laughs> it's not that far from me. It's not that far from you, Carolyn. No, it is. Yeah. If if I wanted to walk it, no, it is. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. I probably should. It'd be good for me. <laughs> you don't talk about your sister much, Tom. Um, I don't know what what am I supposed to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, rare. She tried to visit her. She with a brick when I was nine. I mean. There she we go. <laughs> he hit you with a brick? Well, no, she was upset because I was holding her on the ground and not letting her up. <laughs> well, okay. And so when I finally let her up, she grabbed a brick. <laughs> and came after me. Okay. She did it again. There it is. <laughs> Yeah. Vengeance is mine, saith the sister. <laughs> and and they wanted you to be more like her. Yeah. <laughs> How did I know? Well, it was holding her down. I don't blame her. <laughs> do you have any brothers and sisters? I have a brother. He was younger, two years younger than I am. <clears throat> and Jane, you don't have any brothers or sisters. I have uh, I have half brothers and sisters. I have one half brother on my mother's side, and I have uh, two half sisters and a half brother on my father's side, whom I have never met. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, Violet, do you have any siblings? I have a brother, and I have a. Half, I had a half brother and half sister. Oh, okay. And Bob, you have any siblings? Brother, younger brother and two sisters. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And what about the other Bob? <laughs> He's muted. He's muted. Oh. Okay. And oh, Barry's still there. They're still there on the okay. line. Like, I, I have a brother and two sisters. Oh, nice. Nice. And Betty, what about you? I have a half brother. He's much younger than I am. Okay. And Anne? Anne, do you have? I have two older brothers. Well, one's deceased, is one that was 15 years older than me, and I still have a, one that's seven years older than me. Okay. Of the baby and the only girl. Okay, did we get everybody? I'm the baby yeah. too, Anne. Yeah. <laughs> by, no. by a long shot. <laughs> yeah. So I was to older parents, so I they let me do anything almost. You know, they have to try to carry by that point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Actually have a younger brother also. Well. You have well, a younger I, brother. My well? half brother. My half brother is uh that um uh, grew up with me and my mother <clears throat> was six years old when I went off to college. So um, he still thinks of me as the summer babysitter. Because <laughs> I'd come home in the summertime because my mom worked. And so, uh, um, so I was the summer babysitter. He, <laughs> He still relates to me in that way, I think. <laughs> well, I suppose that could, that may or may not be a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we don't talk a whole lot, so whatever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was the youngest of five. My uh, brother was the oldest. He passed in a helicopter accident in uh, 78, I think it was. He was a month shy of his 28th birthday. And I have three sisters who, as far as I know, are still alive, but I haven't spoken to them in at least five years. Mm -hmm. And I only spoke to them mm -hmm. then because I was, it fell to me to start taking care of my mother. The, the oldest sister who was supposed to be taking care of my mother was abusing her. Ah. Uh. Is anybody that, hearing gunshots besides me? Oh, that's, that's, Betty. that's Betty. She needs to be muted. Betty is okay. shooting up the neighborhood. Yeah. Okay. Just as long oh, as it's sorry. not real. Yeah. 
that's that's why we keep muting Betty. Not that she's yeah saying things that she shouldn't, but that <laughs> her her system makes a lot of static. Well, it's nice to find out a little more about each other. That's great. Yeah, yeah. that's valuable insight to me. I'm a sociologist, of course, but yeah. I love to hear about families and people's pictures clarify in yeah. my mind. Yeah. Oh, that's who you are. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> Yeah. That's why you're messed up. <laughs> <laughs> and so wonderful because we go past these these mark markers, right? Yeah. Back to the, yeah. And and you see how far people have come. That's that's you know and what oh. they overcome. Yeah, and, we see we see the blessings in it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. Kathy, what time are we meeting tonight? In our ninja outfits. Oh, we yeah. Get the nuns. <laughs> Never mind. You got to go up to where is it, New Jersey? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, maybe you should meet earlier <laughs> on I, motorcycle. I, I did tell you that I used to be Wonder Woman now, didn't I? I told yeah. you. Yeah. I, when I went to college, I was Wonder Woman. So there you go. There's your ninja. <laughs> ninja Woman. <sighs> right. Okay, so we have been uh, diligently going through bylaws and, and making new ones, Jane and Anne, Paul and myself, so we've been meeting a few times, and uh, we're still meeting actually today, this afternoon, and um, we're pushing through them, and we do have a great opportunity for someone to be our secretary. We need a secretary. No, we don't need it. It's an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful opportunity for someone to share their talents and their time. And we know, <laughs> right? <laughs> Let's be grateful for the appearance of the secretary, all of yes. us. Yes. yes. Yeah. Really, because we do need to put their name on the paper to send in. So, and we'll help you. We will help you. So think about that. And um, what else? I think we're just working on that. And um, I want to thank everybody for donations and people are mailing me checks, which is really nice. And we never do a donation prayer. So maybe we should do that in our regular meetings. So um, I'll just say a little prayer for all your donations. So I know that God is the source of all supply and that money is God in action. And when we give, we set our set spiritual law in motion. And the divine love as me blesses and multiplies all that I am all that I have, and all that I circulate. So it is. So it is. So, anybody, anything else? I oh. had a qu question about the song, which Paul seemed to know. The, the performer and the name of that song, I want to learn that. Oh. The last one? The, the one the, with... More Than Enough? Is that what you're talking about, Bob? That's Daniel okay. Neymar, Bob. Uh, Daniel okay. Namod. Would you spell that? N A H N A H M O D. -H -M -O -D. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We do we do uh, uh, some of his songs now and then. Very good. Yeah, and uh, if anybody wants to walk that around what is backyard, <laughs> let me know, and we will make a time. That we could do that. It doesn't take long, but it's cute. If you want to come, just let me know. That sounds fun. Yeah. Just, I think probably where, whenever you set a time, will work for us. Uh, Bob, <laughs> there's the more than enough song, and there's a thank a, you. Um, there's a link in that. I'll send ah, I'll yeah. send you that link, Bob. Thank you, Paul. Yeah. Thank you. Hey, Paul, oh, sorry. Paul, Bob Child doesn't have an S on his name. I meant to, I just oh. want to tell you that. 
Okay. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, so, so Bob Rannigan. Uh, now um, that we're almost to Daniel the end Neymar of the also does. Um, uh, Daniel Neymar also does that song, which we which we do occasionally. Love is my decision. If you're familiar with that one, I don't okay. know. Love Thank you. is my decision. It's up to me. Walk down that road. Anyway. <laughs> Love yeah. is my decision. So, we're doing a song now. What song do you, uh, are we doing now? Oh, about, the Blessed Always. Or do you want to do Love is My Decision? I don't know. We know I all can, the words. Well, I can, I you think I have one. that. You had a, the, a, uh, Violet was saying something. A minute ago, you had another song up. Um, Jan Garrett oh, and J.D. Martin. Yes. Yeah. I love all their songs. Yeah. Well, he didn't. He had he had the wrong uh, uh, the wrong music for it apparently. Yeah, oh, he had the oh, he had well. Claudia Carawan's uh, opening song that we do sometimes on um, as the link. I don't know how that happened, but. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, yeah, I love this one. We okay, used to do this fun. one at at Unity. Well, you want me to to do love the. Is my decision. Yeah. You got it. Love is my decision. I can. I can get it. there. Oops. Um. Another time, Paul. All right, sure. Okay. Let, yeah. Well, no, let's close out with that. Okay. So here's okay, Bob. So he's looking for a, another one by Daniel Neymar that we do that we do sometimes. I have all of our music on a presentation and so all I have to do is go to that presentation and click on it there, there it is. and um, I don't know if I should do that so or that not. fits Maybe. in with the service today anyway yeah it does yeah. nice we uncrimp okay. the hose with love all right <laughs> Uh, shall I shall yeah, I try yeah. to play the music here? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Hey, everybody. Love is my decision. It's up to me to give of my heart. Love is my decision no one else can tell me to start and once i decide to change my mind god will show me how love is my decision my decision right here and now love is my decision it's up to me to stand on that bridge love is my decision no one else can make me Once I decide to change my mind, God will show me how. Love is my decision, my decision right here and
my decision right here and now. Love is my decision. It's up to me to dance down the road. Love is my decision. No one else can hide in my decision right here perfect absolutely perfect so as we take in this message and we get what we need to get from it and we learn what we need to learn from it we go about our week and we take responsibility for what's playing on the film in our minds. Knowing we are the directors of our lives and only we can transform our life experiences. Change your thinking, change your mind, change your world. And we open, we open to the flow of life, being aware of our feelings, and making sure we are not crimping the inlet or the outlet of our energy. And we are open, open and more receptive to our good, knowing our good goes before us and makes our way clear. And I love the image that our good presses itself against us and flows through us. And we give of ourselves and we circulate and express our love out. And we live in gratitude, we live in health, we live in safety, knowing all is well and all is God and always available. And I'm always available to you if anybody needs any support. And enjoy your week, enjoy your Halloween. And so we say, and so it is. So it is. So it is. It's always wonderful to see everybody. Thank you for joining us. And um, we're open to receive a secretary anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Kathy, yep. does Ken does Ken have more messages? I mean, does he do a message every Sunday or what? Um, he is a minister, a co-minister of his um, CSL in Canada. He's uh -huh. not always yep. there, but if you Google, uh, let's see, CSL. Kelowna, it's K-E-L-O-W-N-A, Canada. His is not the easiest one to get on. Um, mm -hmm. you have to, they have a Facebook page, but you can Google any um, Centers for Spiritual Living and some of them have video and some of them have audio messages every week. Yeah, I, I like him. I, I hope you bring him back more. Yeah, well, he was the spiritual director until he retired. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I read his things in Science of Mind magazine. Yeah, yeah, I like him too. I met him a few times. He came to Asheville. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Kelowna, Kelowna is kind of north uh, east of Seattle. Mm -hmm. It's east oh. of Vancouver. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Goodbye, everyone. See you next Sunday. Thank Every you. week. Bye. Thank you for leading. Goodbye. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Je um, Anna and Paul, for always doing our Zoom. We couldn't do it. Bye. Bye. Nice to see you. all of you. Paul. He's one of yeah. those. Thank you. And, thank you. and thank a special thanks to Jane and Paul and Ann for helping with the bylaws. So okay, good. yes. We'll meet a little bit here. I have on the screen share there the um, 
the page from the uh, state uh, corporation, corporation commission showing that we're a thing. Center for <laughs> Spiritual Living, Charlottesville Teaching Chapter, Inc. Yes, we are a thing. Yay. <laughs> Very inclusive. We thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. Another corporation. Ah. <laughs> We it's a blessing. Yeah, it's a blessing. I went to operation in Texas. That's what I was like. Yeah. All right. And I thought that we were going to be doing an LLC, but uh, it turns out that that doesn't work with the IRS. And we realized that that would, a LLC is a pass through corporation. So it means that the income would go directly to you, Kathy, and you'd have to report it. So with the incorporated as a C Corp, it has its own income tax and it's all self contained. Oh, nice. And and Bob, I, I did um, I did contact the insurance people you told me to, and they do not handle any of that kind of insurance. But, okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. I want to say thank you to all. And next week, I will get definitely uh, get dressed because it's getting cold <laughs> at this time of year. <laughs> You just really need to to get a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> we don't care what's underneath it. <laughs> you just need to.